I stood on a hill and laughed out loud. I had crossed the Narmada by boat and climbed the headland on the opposite bank from where I could see ranged across the crowns of low bald hills the Adivasi hamlets of Sikka, Surung, Ningawan and Domkedi. I could see their airy fragile homes. I could see their fields and the forests behind them. I knew I was looking at a civilization older than Hinduism, slated, sanctioned by the highest court in the land, to be drowned this monsoon when the waters of the Sardar Sarovar Reservoir will rise to submerge it. Why did I laugh? Because I suddenly remembered the tender concern with which the Supreme Court judges in Delhi, before vacating the legal stay on further construction of the Sardar Sarovar Dam, had inquired whether Adivasi children in the resettlement colonies would have children's parks to play in. I looked up at the endless sky and down at the river rushing past, and for a brief, brief moment, the absurdity of it all reversed my rage, and I laughed. I meant no disrespect. The charge against me is criminal contempt of court. I've been accused of lowering the dignity of the Supreme Court, of scandalizing it and lowering its authority, and that's a criminal offense. And uh, the hearings are over, so I've been asked to appear personally before the 6th of March to await the judgment. I could be sent to prison for six months or for two months or for one day or until the rising of the court, or I could be humiliated and let off. It's about three and a half out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> that bad? But no, 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 that's good. Oh, is it? My marks are generally low. Okay, 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 okay. Anyway, jokes aside, it looks like bad. Looks like curtains. My run-in with the Supreme Court began some years ago when I began to write about the big dams in the Narmada Valley and the extraordinary resistance movement that has grown along its banks. of gratitude for all kinds of understanding. I grew up in Aymanam on the banks of the Meenachal. I always think that as a very young child, those hours that I spent catching fish were the hours that made me the writer that I am. The hours of silence, the hours of contemplating and trying to insinuate yourself into the head of an unsuspecting fish. It was easier for me to understand the Narmada Valley and the problems there because I think I understand the river, not as an environmentalist or as an ecologist, but just because a river was my friend when I was little. And the loss of a river is a terrible, aching thing. जीना 
संभव ही नहीं क्योंकि अगर डूब बिना विकल्प के छोपी जाती है तो ये सारे प्रतिनिधि जिन परिवारों से आए हैं अपने सब लाखों बाल बच्चे सब बर्बाद होकर दिल्ली में जो 10 लाख आदिवासी बिहार से अलग अलग जगह से आकर पड़े हैं वैसे यहाँ झुग्गी झोपड़ी में रहेंगे क्या तो नहीं हटेंगे ये कहा है क्योंकि ये परियोजना झूठ है When I decided to write about the Narmada, I really felt that what was missing in this fight was the story, the whole story, all the connections. And I I really wanted to tell the story in all its detail but accessible to an ordinary reader because I really believe that the story of the Narmada Valley is the story of modern India. not just of modern india but it is a story of what is happening in the world today who counts who doesn't what matters what doesn't what counts as a cost what doesn't what counts as collateral damage what doesn't it's really a question of how power shines the light and what it chooses to illuminate and what it chooses to leave in the darkness i see my job as being to to increase the area which is lit as much as i can to say look this is not the only thing that's going on just because it's dark there and they're not shining a light there that doesn't mean nothing is happening there but if i was going to write about it i knew that instinct wasn't enough i knew that i would have to argue with the world about it i needed to know the algebra i needed to know exactly what the mathematics were it wasn't the arithmetic that i discovered that shocked me as much as the arithmetic that i didn't discover it wasn't what the facts that exist that shocked me as much as the facts officially that didn't exist i asked a couple of very vulgar questions how many big dams are there in india that there was a figure for 3600 how many people have been displaced by these big dams there was no official figure that chilled me If you consider that Adivasis account for only 8% and Dalits another 15% of India's population it opens up a whole other dimension to the story this is the algebra of infinite justice the ethnic otherness of their victims takes some pressure off the nation builders it's like having an expense account someone else pays the bills people from another country another world India's poorest people are subsidizing the lifestyles of her richest. Did I hear someone say something about the world's biggest democracy? The paperback of the God of Small Things had just come out and that's when the nuclear tests happened. Today at 15:45 hours India conducted three underground nuclear tests in the Pokhran Range. I'm just talking about a civilization that produced Mahatma Gandhi. What does it mean to us to have nuclear bombs now? So I suddenly realized that I have the space. I command the space in which to raise a dissenting voice. And if I don't do it, it's as political an act as doing it I, i mean to stay quiet is as political an act as speaking out that's when i wrote the end of imagination my essay against the nuclear test <laughs> you know the god of small things became more and more successful and i watched 
as in the city I lived in, the air became blacker, the cars became sleeker, the gates grew higher, and the poor were being stuffed like lice into the crevices. And all the time my bank account burgeoned, I began to feel as though every feeling in the God of Small Things had been traded in for a silver coin. And if I wasn't careful, I would, I would become a little uh, silver figurine with a cold silver heart. And around that time, when this discomfort was growing, suddenly the Supreme Court lifted a stay and allowed the Sardar Sarovar Dam to be built up by another five meters. I was present at a demonstration outside the gates of the Supreme Court. The people at the demonstration were basically people from the valley who had been displaced by the dam at its current height, had not been resettled, and they were there to tell the court that it was wrong. What happened after that was that a, a group of five lawyers filed a case in the Supreme Court alleging that I and Medha Patkar and Prashant Bhushan, who's the lawyer of the NBA, had tried to kill them and that we had shouted slogans against the court. I'd never set eyes on these lawyers before. I had absolutely no idea who they were. A friend of mine, Sanjay Kak, he's been filming in the valley for some years now, so he's filmed it all. And of course, there are the police, the cameras, everything was there, it's all on, on record. So, I had tried to kill this man. They were organizing orgy on the gate of the Supreme Court. And they were trying only to... Orgy, what? Orgy, orgy. 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 Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Orgy means violent, unrest and agitation. Okay. She caught my beard. Are and she hugged me. Now, now it is okay. For judges, they are pious. I like Hindu widow. They are lords they of our country. Be, they, judges should oh, be on touch. Supreme Court. Judges right are, the, land. the status of judges are as pious as Hindu ladies of Hindustan. They should be untouched from public criticism and from press. It was a ludicrous charge. It wasn't even accepted by the local police station. The court eventually dismissed those lawyers' petition, then filed yet another contempt case against me, suo moto, which means the court itself took on the case against me, for three paragraphs in my affidavit, which they said, have lowered the authority of the Supreme Court. I think that they need to keep the legal system and the legal system and the legal system and the legal system. They need to keep 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 the legal system. I'm just quoting from the affidavit. It indicates a disquieting inclination on the part of the court to silence criticism and muzzle dissent to harass and intimidate those who disagree with it. By entertaining a petition that even a local police station does not see fit to act upon, the Supreme Court is doing its own reputation and credibility considerable harm. The judges were initially quite hostile, but um, the drama is of course that as you use, they didn't allow anybody into the court. They said, you know, they said, yes, yes, it's a public court, people can come in, but they, the registry, the registrar has explicitly said that in this case, no one is allowed in, so no one was allowed in. The Supreme Court is today the most powerful institution in India, for my money, the most unaccountable. It has, in the past, taken some very enlightened decisions. So what's happening now, I feel, is that the climate, the political climate in the courts are changing. 
and today the court is taking decisions that affect the lives of millions of people, for better or for worse. It's deciding whether dams should be built or not, whether slums should be cleared, whether industry should be removed from cities. Now when you wade into public life on that scale, you have to be accountable. Today the Supreme Court is legitimizing privatization, structural adjustment. Whether you agree with that or not, it must at least be open to criticism, to debate. And the Contempt of Court Act blocks that. And that's why it must be challenged. And that's why this must be looked at in that political context. आप लोग माफी मांगे में डूबा रहे बड़े बड़े भाग भाग रहे लोगों को उजाड़ रहे तस नस कर रहे आप लोग मांग रहे हम क्यों मांगे नागरिक का तो सवाल है लड़ने का of the Narmadas. I'll try and tell it as simply as I can. The Narmada Valley Development Project envisages building 3,200 dams on a single river and its tributaries. It is the biggest river valley project in India that will alter the ecology of an entire river basin that will affect the lives for better or for worse of 25 million people that will submerge 4,000 square kilometers of dry deciduous forest and will end up turning the Narmada into a step reservoir you know like a shining staircase of amenable water you know with destruction in its wake. We are all taught from the time we are little children in school. Cha Cha Nem said that dams are the temples of modern India, etc. Never mind that Cha Cha Nehru actually reversed his view and no one is taught about that. In the local pain for national gain mythology of big dams, the costs are always underplayed and the benefits inflated to absurd levels. In its official publicity film for the dam, the Gujarat government claims that it will bring water to 30 million people. Blazing sun, burning sands, imagine trudging miles every day just to fetch water. 30 million people will soon receive water thanks to the Sardar Sarova Narmada Dam. Say yes to Narmada. If you present a project saying, oh, you're going to displace 200 villages and actually bring prosperity to millions of people, it sounds like a reasonable deal. But in fact, it's just simply untrue. It's just one big lie. The mathematics is wrong. That's the problem here. What big dams do is that they centralize resources like water. They snatch a river away from the poor. They centralize the water. And then they decide who can get it. And who can get it? The big sugar farmer lobbies, the big industrialists, the big farmers, the politically powerful lobbies. People melt into the darkness and disappear and the sugar cane fields spring up in Gujarat and the industries spring up in wherever it is and then they say, look, there's a green revolution. You have the Bargi Dam, for instance, the first dam that was built on the Narmada Valley where 
they, before they built the dam, said that 70,000 people from 101 villages would be submerged. And then when the dam was completed, they closed the gates and just filled the reservoir one monsoon to see what would happen. And in fact, 114,000 people in 162 villages were submerged. The water just rose overnight, driving people out of their homes, taking their children and their cattle and running for their lives while their homes floated away. There was no resettlement. Even the so-called model resettlement villages, one or two of them got submerged. And, and now the people who've been displaced by Bargi are living in slums in Jabalpur, begging, plying rickshaws. These were farmers' wives. And today, that Bargi Dam, 11 years later, irrigates 5% of the land it was supposed to irrigate. It actually irrigates less land than it's submerged. July 99 will bring the last monsoon of the 20th century. The ragged army in the Narmada Valley has declared that it will not move when the waters of the Sardar Sarovar Reservoir rise to claim its lands and homes. Whether you love the dam or you hate it, whether you want it or you don't, it is in the fitness of things that you understand the price that's being paid for it, that you have the courage to watch while the dues are cleared and the books are squared. Our dues, our books, not theirs. So be there. After the essay was published in the press, a group of us organized what now is known as the Rally for the Valley, where we called for people, for outsiders, for people from all over the world and from people's organizations and resistance movements all over India to travel through the valley to see this, you know, what the struggle was all about. The whole valley rose up somehow, the spontaneity, the, the, the happiness that someone outside cared that their struggle had registered, that it mattered. And that's deadly by, she's called, of Dom Kheri. And at the end of the rally, she, she gave me this basket of all the different kinds of seed, of all the different kinds of plants and food and wheat and lentils and rice that they grow. And she's here saying, tell me, where will they be able to replace this for us if they throw us out of here, if they take the river away from us, if they take our ancestral land away from us, will they be able to give us all this? How do you define violence? If you hit a man on the head, but you leave him with a job and a home, is that more violent than not hitting him on the head, but depriving him of his home, his livelihood, his ancestral lands, his family? It's about breaking the spirit. And the state has different ways of breaking different spirits. So what they will do to an Adivasi protesting in the valley is different from what they will do to an activist in the valley, is different to what they will do to a journalist who is being troublesome, is different to the way they treat a writer. But eventually it's about wearing down your spirit. The last person I met in the valley was Bhaiji Bhai. Bhaiji Bhai lost 17 of his 19 acres to the Wonder Canal. So he doesn't qualify as an officially displaced person. Like his neighbors in Kevadia colony, Bhaiji Bhai became a pauper overnight. Bhaiji Bhai and his people forced to smile for photographs on government calendars. Bhaiji Bhai and his people 
denied the grace of rage. Bhai ji bhai and his people squashed like bugs by this country they're supposed to call their own. Bhai ji bhai, bhai ji bhai, when will you get angry? When will you stop waiting? When will you say that's enough and reach for your weapons, whatever they may be? When will you show us the whole of your resonant, terrifying, invincible strength? When will you break the faith? Will you break the faith or will you let it break you? What happens to all the people who are driven off their land? What happens to the millions of people who have been displaced by big dams without resettlement? They come to the cities in search of employment. They live in the slums and in the unauthorized colonies of the city. <laughs> they are the informal sector, the people that are not supposed to exist in this city. So for every box of tissues they sell, they'll be pay paying the police and they'll be paying every petty official that can otherwise lock them up. But the thing is that the, you know, like the Adivasis who get displaced, it's not easy, you know, even to do this work, you need to understand how a city works. You need to be savvy, you know, smart to survive in an urban environment. And the Supreme Court says resettlement is good for them. It will bring them into the mainstream. It will bring them fruits of modern development. For the last 50 years since independence, there's not been one road, not one school, not one clinic, not one hospital. And now you tell them that you give us everything we have, you have. You give us all your land, give us your history, give us your language, give us your past, and give you, we'll give you the fruits of modern development, which are basically servitude and humiliation and landlessness. March the 6th is 20 days away, so um, um, I'm feeling, um, I don't know how I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling angry that I have to keep wondering and thinking about what I'm feeling because that's the punishment, that's what, that's what they wanted when on the 15th of January they said you'll be personally present in court to hear the judgment. I'm supposed to spend all that time speculating about what's going to happen to me. And um, that's, a, that's a terrible thing because eventually this is a public fight and a political fight and one has to be public and political about it. Yet it's also personal and it's also very difficult for me to decide when to be personal and when to be public. And, um, you know, in a moment like this, maybe you don't want to put uh, your personal self out there, but you have to because, because it can only be fought in a public arena, this fight, and it must be done. It's one thing to ban a book. It's another thing to imprison a writer for writing. Whenever I go abroad, I'm always invited to portray myself as this sort of radical person who's being hunted down by these institutions in this native banana republic. I mean, I'm not saying that there are many things about India that are like a banana republic, but that goes for America as well. But just now, I insist on looking at this as a conversation that I'm having with an institution that, that exists in the society that I live in. 
and this is the way in which democracy becomes more sophisticated. The dangerous thing about criticizing the state today is that the third party insinuates itself in the picture, Mr. Free Market, and says, well, here we are, the new alternative to your corrupt state. Try us now for something different. But the truth is that there isn't a difference between the two. There isn't a choice. It's just being made to appear like a choice. If you look at the Narmada Valley, you have the Sardar Sarovar Dam and the Maheshwar Dam next to each other. I see them like a pair of incomplete tombs that bury terrible secrets. One is presented to the world as a public project, a state project. The other is presented to the world as a private project, the first private Hydul project in India. But if you look at them, the, the brutality, the corruption, the atrocities are all the same. In fact, the Maheshwar project, it's actually made with public money. The risks are public and the profits are private. That's the dawn that we walked through to capture the Maheshwar Dam site. Uh, I can still remember the sound, just the crunching of feet and the slip slap, slip slap of slippers. We set out at three in the morning. We walked for three hours. Farmers, fisher folk, sand miners, writers, painters, filmmakers, lawyers, journalists. All of India was represented, urban, rural, touchable, untouchable. We were not just fighting against a dam, we were fighting for a philosophy, for a worldview. <laughs> That's me being arrested along with some other women. They always want to separate the people they see as, as the troublemakers from the others. Of course, in Maheshwar, every woman is a troublemaker. When people talk about the free market, they talk about a level playing field. But we live in a world where disparity and inequality have been institutionalized for thousands of years. You have racism and class and caste and religion and ethnic divisions. This is the kind of world that we live in. So in a world like this, what is the free market? It's like playing marbles on a very steep slope. However good you are at playing marbles, all the marbles are going to roll downhill and the people who are downhill are going to own all the marbles. And they are the ones who are going to eventually make all the decisions. They are the ones who control the WTO and the IMF and the World Bank. And in a context like this, they are the ones who use institutions in developing countries, parliamentary institutions, the court, the press, are all then being manipulated by them. In a democracy, what, is, what are you doing by privatizing infrastructure? You're disengaging politics from the market. You're taking away the last weapon that a poor man has, which is his vote. The people who have to own fundamental responsibility for the Sardar Sarovar project is the World Bank. Last year, Wolfenson, the president of the World Bank, had come on a visit to Delhi. The people of the Narmada Valley blockaded the road outside the World Bank office. They had come all the way from the valley to protest because there was a rumor that the World Bank was going to renew its funding for some aspect of the Sardar Sarovar drinking water plan or something. 
They just sat on the road and said they wouldn't move until Wolfenstein came out. I was with them. So it was twilight by the time he came out. I'd been sitting there all day. When he came out, somehow the, the writer in me, the script writer in me just stood up and left in disgust. I just didn't want to be part of that, that, that script because I was just seeing this white man in a pinstripe suit addressing the peasants of India all over again. I didn't, I didn't want to hear what he said. I didn't want to hear his reassurances. Although it may not appear to you to be the case, I personally care a lot for people in poverty, and I work hard to try and make the lives of people better. I just kept thinking, who the hell are you? You know, how are you back here after all these years? Was all this for nothing? The World Bank pulled out of the Sardar Sarovar project in 1993, but the mess it made lives on. In 1999, you had people standing in their homes, chest deep in water, their, their pots and pans were floating out, some houses were washed away. While all this was happening, the Supreme Court had three sittings where the only subject they discussed was whether the NBA and Arundhati Roy, through her writings, had lowered the dignity of the court. It says, Judicial process and institution cannot be permitted to be scandalized or subjected to contumacious violation in such a blatant manner in which it has been done by her. Vicious stultification and <laughs> it's so funny. Vicious stultification and vulgar debunking cannot be permitted to pollute the stream of justice. When the Supreme Court actually lifted its stay and allowed the construction of the dam to proceed, there was a big celebration orchestrated by the Gujarat government at the dam site. The chief guest was Mr. L.K. Adwani, the Home Minister. <laughs> bombs, dams, walls, but he makes them on the other side of the line. So when he makes the connection, 
It's a patriotic act. And when I make the connection, it's a criminal offense. Big dams are just huge wet cement flags that wave in our mind. You're supposed to accept them as an article of faith. And if you question them, you're anti-national, you're a seditionist, you're a foreign agent. Corporate globalization, nationalism, and religious fundamentalism are all marching hand in hand through the 21st century. And each of them sets off the other. Each of them is almost necessary for the other. When I first went to the valley, I used to say that I'm not here because my house is being submerged or my fields are going underwater, but my worldview is being submerged. That's why I'm here. But it's not just that anymore. They're knocking at my door. They're coming for me. And therefore, I know that I have to fight with all the skill that I have, which is my words, my ideas, my ability to communicate. I believe that the only hope and the only thing worth globalizing is dissent. And I think that when the Supreme Court comes for us, for the artists, for the writers, for the filmmakers, for the musicians, we have to show them our terrifying strength. And we have to fight back with our art. Hi, Mum. I'm calling to ask you, have you heard anything about the case? No, I'm in uh, my office. They were objecting to the last chapter of The God of Small Things, which they said corrupted public morality, and therefore the book should be banned. So though it's that time of the month <laughs> for it to be coming up right now is strange because it's as if the legal net is closing around me in some way. Every day, the skin is stripped off you, and you, you have to deal with it. And really, as a writer, you can either shy away from it, or you can take it as a challenge and say, well, I'm a different kind of writer now. And I hope that's a good thing, because in a way, you know, people say that writers keep writing the same book over and over again. And I've written the book I wanted to write, and now, I am swimming in, in, in the river of life, and, and uh, I hope what comes out will be literature at the end of it, but who knows. I don't think they're going to actually send me to jail, but there's a small chance, and I'm prepared for that. So, oof, it'll be so nice when this is over. Come on,
सुंदर चलनी फिर सिया रहा I'm at this Arundhati Roy hearing, which you may have heard very well. Um, con con contempt of court. She, she wrote some rude things about the Supreme Court, um, which pissed them off. This is a statement which she has issued. I stand by what I have said and I am prepared to suffer the consequences. The judgment only confirms what I said in my affidavit. It wasn't an easy decision to make, but in the end I didn't want to be a martyr to a cause that isn't mine alone. And suffering, choosing to suffer, isn't exactly my style. The establishment has always feared writers because writers have the weapon of clarity and when they choose to use it, it can be deadly. <laughs> <laughs>